The title of tonight's message is Living Joy. Can you say that with me? Living Joy, Living Joy. The series is Cultivate Joy. Uh, tonight's message is entitled Living Joy, Living Joy. Uh, how many of you have ever had a teacher or a leader or somebody in ministry that you have looked up to? And uh, let, let me ask you, how did they lead so that you wanted to follow them? Anybody? Yes, PC. Their servanthood. Good, good. Anybody else ever had a leader or a teacher, somebody that you looked up to and how they... Yes, Daryl. How they loved others. Okay, good. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm not going to... Uh, oh, yes, Monique. How they love God. How they love God. Good. And Laurie? Their faithfulness to God. Yep, their faithfulness to God in prayer. Very good. These are all good examples. I'm not going to ask you negative examples of leaders <laughs> because we might have to stay here for a very long time. Oftentimes than not, Leadership or people whom we look up to and respect are those who lead by example. Everything that you've said, those who love God, those who showed faithfulness to God, those who pray, they are the ones who have shown what it is by example. They lead the way and then invite you to follow. Of course, for us Christ followers, Jesus is the best model of leadership anyone could ever know. He led by loving he led by serving. He led by sacrificing. He led in the way that he willfully laid down his life, all for the glory of God, to fulfill God's will in his life and for our lives as well. Jesus is the perfect model for leadership. Don't look anywhere else. Always look to Jesus. And the way that he forgave was one of the most powerful moments in all of history. The ones he created were the ones who said, crucify. And they nailed him to a cross. And still Jesus would pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And do you know what Jesus is doing right now? His example for us is that he is interceding for all of us at the right hand of the Father. He's not just uh, at the right hand of the Father. The right hand means positional, the position of power. And so with the position of power and the authority that he has, he is praying for you. He is praying for me. He leads by example. So what do we do as followers of Jesus? We follow him. We follow Jesus' example of loving, loving those who are unlovable, teaching about the kingdom of God, healing, delivering his journey with his disciples, and I am pretty sure that Jesus had a lot of laughs with his disciples. I am sure that he was a man of joy. I think Jesus probably would have cracked the best jokes that history has ever known. The most humorous person. He would take things and say to the disciples and teach them, but with humor and wit, because he is God, the creator of joy. Paul, who is writing to the Philippians, is a person who has met the Lord Jesus as he was on the way to Damascus to persecute some more Christians, the people of the way. Paul, without doubt, thought his zeal for God was to persecute those who are following Jesus. And yet when Paul encountered Jesus himself, everything turned around from Saul to Paul a person that was bent on persecuting the church to the one who would actually die for Christ, proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul says in tonight's text, these things that really shows us by example what to do as Christians. Verse 12, let me read. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This pressing on 
is a message that he will again say in verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win. He does not press on to lose. He presses on to the goal that which God has given him. He presses on and he does not give up. Somebody like Paul is a character uh, trait that many type A personalities would love to follow. He just does not give up. People of resilience knows that Paul, even though he was persecuted, beaten, stoned, flogged, shipwrecked, hungry, torn, cast out, he kept on pressing on towards which that Christ had called him to. That is the mission of Paul's life. The calling helped him to persevere through the strife and the difficulty. Let me try to explain to you in this way. This pressing on, not giving up. When you know that there is something of value that you can obtain by persevering and practicing, then nothing else will deter you. How many of you have ever had a goal and you've worked so hard to reach that goal? Yes, good. I'm sure many of us have had that goal. I share this in confidence just between you and I, since we're a very good group tonight. Uh, in my uh, younger years, uh, I, I didn't get a lot of pocket money. Anybody relate to that? Uh, we can all relate because when we're young, I mean, that, the money that we get is not enough, right? But I learned to save, and I finally got that thing that I wanted. I wanted a Game Gear, and I got it. Lo and behold, I didn't have money to buy the game pack that needed to be inserted to actually play the game. I was devastated. I saved all that money. I, I even passed by the, the candy shop and I said no to toffees. I said no to everything and I just pressed on to that goal. And then when I turned it on, the music came on, Sega. But there was no game. I was pressing the buttons and I was so devastated. The kindness of my parents compelled them to love me. And they went on ahead and bought me a single pack. And I put that in and I was a happy camper. Now, why do I tell you this? It tells you of the, the limitations of certain things on this planet that we strive so hard after to get. And then when we get it, we find out, oh my goodness, that's it. The newness wears off. The, the joy of having that slight pleasure wears off. Paul, though, he knows the calling and the mission that he has been called to, that which is eternal, joy. He has that hope, he has that faith, and he has embraced the love of God in such a way that he's saying to the people, the church in Philippi, and to us tonight, don't give up. Don't give up this race that God has laid you upon. Don't give up going through the narrow gate and going on the narrow road. Do not give up. Yes, the broad way seems much easier. It's much easier to give up the truth of God's word and follow what the world is inviting you into. It's easier. Paul is leading by example. I press on, I press on, I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Grace upon grace. Don't give up the fight. Let me go a little bit further. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. Don't say it's too late. I've come too far. I've done too many wrong things. Do not give up on the sanctifying work that God is doing in you. One of the greatest joys that I found is that when God transforms me and his sanctifying grace is in effect in me and I see change, I don't respond the same way. I don't say the same things. I don't act the same way. God is able to bring me into a person that 
wow, nice to meet you. Because I'm being restored to the image of God. That's my real identity. Do you know who you are? Do you know that your identity, if not anchored in the I am who I am, you have no identity at all. But when we are anchored in the precious blood of Jesus, in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, when we know that our hearts have been totally set over to the will of God, guess what? I am a new creation. And sometimes your old self, your old creation will try to haunt you and say, no, come this way, do this. You're like, no, that's dead to me. For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is I that no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I mean, some of you, if, if I came to you and said, can I observe you for 24 hours? I am pretty certain that you would actually be very meticulous about the things that you watch on your phone. Or what you watch on TV, or what you read. Maybe you'll actually bring out your Bible knowing when I'm coming, and you'll be like, you'll put it on your coffee table. And as I'm with you, you'll be like uh, twiddling your thumb for a little while. And then you'll probably open up the Bible. Because pastor's here, right? But think of it this way. Holy Spirit indwells within all of us who believe in Jesus Christ by faith. Amen? Would you feel comfortable inviting Holy Spirit to an R-rated movie? Anybody? Would you feel comfortable going to the bar with the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, I just need, I just need a, a drink. What about doing some drugs together? Holy Spirit, I just need to be high. I want to be high. Many of you would probably get your act together. Not out of legalism, but just the knowing of this wonderful Savior that resides within my heart. And that's the joy of holiness. I, I read on a billboard, driving past a billboard, sober is the new cool. I mean, that says something. That means the world is drunk, right? The world is drunk on whatever substance. Clarity comes when we focus on Jesus himself and the work that he has finished on the cross for our sins. When we focus, it is not just about his death, but also about his resurrection. He laid down his life only to take it back up again. And that resurrecting power that raised Jesus from the dead resides within you and within me. So what do I have to fear? The devil has a lot to fear. Praise the Lord. There was a, a lady, a devout lady, and uh, she learned that there was going to be a, uh, a gathering of, of shamans in one city. And on the final day of the shaman get-together, the world gathering, the world conference of shamans. Does anybody know what a shaman is? Like a rainmaker, you know, they do stuff to make rain come down and whatnot, right? Uh, just simply devil worshippers, okay? Devil worshippers. Uh, and the world conference was, and this devout lady was praying, and she knew that she had to go there. She had to go there. She, she felt this urgency to be a part not a part of them, but to shine God's light in that place. So this world conference, the final day, they were going to do this big thing, and it was on a boat. So they rented out a boat, and all of these shamans are on the boat, and uh, she, this lady just walks on board, and, and they didn't ask her any questions. Uh, everybody's, you know, just on board, and, and, the, and the boat is going downstream, and they are doing their thing. Whatever they do, right? Doing shaman stuff like calling out to their God and doing stuff. And she, in the middle of the boat, quietly is just praying. Lord, I come against the enemy in Jesus' name. And whatever they are asking for, I forbid that in Jesus' mighty name. So she's just praying and binding the enemy. And guess what happened? There was an emergency meeting that was held with all the shamans because they were trying to do something, but they could not generate any of that spiritual power. Something was happening on that ship. There was one 
devout lady who believed in Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, she was binding up all the evil spirits. And guess what? The light was shining in the darkness. As we hear these things, it should remind us that the power that God has placed in us is greater than that which is in the world. We ought not to be afraid of Salem on Halloween night. Salem ought to be afraid of the church of Jesus Christ shining that light, being conduits of God's grace and love and mercy. Watch out. Now, we do this under the grace of God, with all humility. Why? Because we are like the beggars who found the food first, and we lead other beggars to find the food right here. Jesus, he has liberated me. He has set me free. So, pressing on to that goal, not giving up on this journey of sanctification and holiness is God's invitation to us tonight. But in order for us to do that, we must not forget verse 13. Verse 13 is this. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Remember, one thing he does, what is it? Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Did you hear that? You need to forget what was behind and you strive towards what is ahead. Many Christians are stuck in the past. Many Christians fall under the condemnation of the past that they cannot live in the present nor even have any vision for the future. It, it's like being stuck in, a, uh, in, in, in quicksand. You get bogged down with the, with the past. By the way, the enemy often attacks me with the past as well. You're not the only one. Do you know what I do when I get attacked with the past? I go to the Word of God. There are, word, there are uh, verses that are hidden in my heart, and I go right to it. But I want to share with you one weapon that I use so that you can use it not to stay stuck in the past. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Just one book after Philippians is Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, reading a couple of verses from chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, this is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What is this? Set your minds on things above. The past is not the things above. Many of our past are the things of the earth. Does that make sense? Things that we're not proud of. Stuff that we said, things that we did. Things that we thought up of. And yet, the enemy tries to bring that to you and condemn you and pull you down and say, oh, you are worth that, the past. When God has made you into a new creation, and for those who have repented of your sins, Jesus says, I'm going to forgive you. Right? He forgives us. Forgiveness, not on your terms, on his terms. Forgiveness, not your definition, but his definition. Forgiveness that he does not remember your sins anymore as far as the east is from the west. He has removed our transgressions from us. He doesn't even remember it no more. It's as if when we say to God, Lord, I'm sorry for the sin I committed 23 years ago. I'm really sorry. God's like, huh? What, what are you saying? I, I, it's not in my records, right? But we're listening to the devil, condemnation, and we say no to that. I keep my head, I keep my thoughts on the things above. The things above are good for the present, the things above is good for what is to come. The things above is the grace that has covered my past. Some people are haunted by the past, haunted by it. And I fight that with the word of God. And by God's grace, he reminds me, son, you're secure. You're safe. Son, no stains, clean as wool, pure. Why? The blood of Jesus has cleansed you. 
The blood of Jesus has cleansed me. And so, what do I do? I forget what is behind. I forget it. Why? Because I'm so busy straining towards what is ahead. I'm so busy in doing the kingdom work that God has called me to do that I have no time to look behind. If you've ever focused on something that is worthwhile, you'll know that time is not not something that will restrain you because you will go for it, right? You will go for it. You will put everything to it. I mean, even those people, those athletes who, who run and jump and do all sorts of stuff, right? Catch balls, throw balls, whatever. They spend time in in practicing their trade and skill to be good at it, right? I mean, that's a good thing, not not bad at all. But it's not eternal. Striving towards the eternal. Perhaps the striving towards what is ahead for you and I today is this. Striving towards those souls that God wants to bring into the kingdom. Perhaps it's agonizing over those souls and saying, Lord, would you save them? Would you bring them in? What do I need to do? Whatever, Lord, I, I, I just, some people pray, Lord, whatever you need to do to them, do it so that they can go. That's a good prayer. But a higher level prayer is, what do I need to do? Oh, God, <laughs> whatever you need to do in me that, that needs to be done, I will do it, Lord. Striving for what is ahead is is Paul's way of living in joy. It's a living joy. It's not a dead joy. It's not something that is rote. Why? If you're continually looking at the revelation and, and the dreams and the visions God is giving you, you have no time to dwell in the past. Of course, we can give thanks to God for what he has done in the past. Can I get an amen? Yes, of course we can give thanks. But not dwelling on that. Well, pastor, back in the day, in the 70s, we used to do ministry this way. And that's the only way, so we've got to do it now. I'll give you a partial amen to that. I praise God for what he did in the 70s with that method. But we're not in the 70s no more. It's a different generation. The message stays the same. The method can change. And we need God's wisdom and vision to reach these generations who are stuck to their phones 24-7. Can I get an amen? Somehow we need to get in those phones with the gospel of Jesus. Because you're not going to get them to church. The church has to come to them. These are some new... Some of you are like, oh my goodness, what does that mean? It means we need to get active in striving for these souls and asking the Lord to give us wisdom, better wisdom than all of the media companies and the companies that want to steal your money, right? We need to have the perfect strategy from heaven and strive in going after souls. My goodness, I'm so excited. You know, when when we have our staff talks, you know, I, I talk about we need to be better than Apple, Google, and Microsoft combined. We just need, have to be better than them. Why? Because they're selling stuff that's not going to last forever. We have the gospel. <laughs> we have the good news of Jesus. We must make it better, more compelling. We've we got to overcome YouTube in Jesus' name. right? You know, We've got to dominate it, flood it with good content, gospel content. <laughs> so somehow they're watching TikTok and they, they get gospel. They get gospel. They get the gospel. There's so much bad stuff out there. And we're like, oh, pastor, it's just so rough and bad. No, stop being consumers of the bad. Get, become creators of the good. Become creators of the good. Don't be afraid of, oh, there's so much bad content. Oh, oh, son, close your eyes or daughter. No, create so much gospel that whatever they say, it's like, oh, that's another God. Praise the Lord. That's another word of God, right? That word of God, word of God, word of God. Spirit of God, spirit of God, spirit of God. Anointed words, blessings, power, dominion, glory. We declare in the name of Jesus that God is greater. That God loves these souls. And I'm excited for what God can do through people who stop consuming content and begin to create for the glory of God. 
come on, don't just think about it. If you watch an hour of content, I say create three hours of content. Right? Create. Create it. Be on God's team. <laughs> and strive for what is ahead. God wants more souls. Amen? He wants souls to be saved and come to the knowledge. And that is his heart. Our hearts need to break for what breaks God's heart. And these people who are stuck to stuff, don't try to get them off of it. In God's timing, behavior will change. Behavior will come. Amen? Belief in Jesus comes first. Sometimes we need to embrace them so hard that they feel that belonging. And then the behavior will come. Brothers and sisters, there is an opportunity for us, this generation, to reach the lost, reach the last, reach the least. Don't stay stuck in the past. Don't stay there. Keep moving on. It is an upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Not looking back. It is an upward call. Looking up, Lord, grant me revelation to speak words of truth. Grant me the right words to say to my colleagues and to my co-workers and to my boss. Grant me the right words to share, oh God. I just love it that Paul, he is living this joy, living this life and says, come follow me on it. Come follow me on it. Verse 15, let's read. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. What view? Pressing on. Forgetting what is behind, pressing on toward that goal. Amen? And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So Paul is allowing room for differences of opinion. Praise God. I love that. God's not looking for, you know, uniformity. He's looking for unity. Right? And you can use your own method to share the gospel. It might not be mine. But praise God, continue to win souls for the Lord. Continue to disciple them. Continue to send them out, right? But God will make it clear to you in God's time. Verse 16, only let us live up to what we have already attained. The faith and the hope and the love of Christ and the joy that cannot be taken away. This joy uh, is not just being ecstatic all the time. There is a steady joy that some of you need to learn. A steadfast joy. Because if we get the full dose of God's joy, we'll probably die. (laughs) You know, it's like, oh no, too much. A steadfast joy. Steadfast waters. Every day. Breathe out. Breathe in. Being able to walk with him. And when he says run, we'll run with him. Right? That steadfast joy. Let's continue here. Verse 17, join with others in following my example. This is him inviting him to his lifestyle of living joy, right? And take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Now he's going to give you some negative examples. Verse 18, For as I have often told you before, now stay again, even with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny, verse 19, is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Do you see this happening in today's age? Like, more people... Have you ever seen these people who, like, live to eat? They just... They don't eat to live. (laughs) They live to eat, like... Let's go to this place and that place and this place and and just continue to consume, consume, consume. It's not just about eating food. I'm talking about consumption with your eyes, ears, right? With your heart. Consume, consume, consume. It's actually a trap of the enemy because it is an insatiable thirst that the enemy is strategizing to get you. To get you. Because how much content is enough? Or how much drugs is enough? How much booze is enough? It's never enough. Can I get an amen? How many Twinkies are enough for you, uh, Liz? Twinkie, do you like Twinkies at all? Yeah? How, how many is enough for you? Unlimited. Unlimited, thank you. At least somebody is honest in this house. Unlimited. 
Exactly. By the way, I've never tasted Twinkies in my whole life, so um, I, don't, I just use it as an example. It's just an example. But it's not enough, whatever it is, whatever it is. But what is, what is God telling us through the words of Paul? Follow his example. And we're going to learn about his example uh, soon uh, when we come to uh, Philippians chapter 4. He learns the secret of being content. Everybody say content. Whether well fed or not fed. Right? Whether in times of despair or joy. He has, con- he has learned the secret of being content. Are you content? Can I share with you something very personal? Again, just between you and I. For the longest time, we had a pile of rubbish on our front lawn. Just rubbish. Everybody say rubbish. rubbish. Just rubbish. It's like stuff. And it was painful to see every day. Painful. Because I don't like rubbish. Do you like rubbish? No. Every day I would pass by, it's just rubbish. But... God gave me faith that one day that rubbish will be turned into something. And so, uh, although it was a sore in my eye, I would say, Lord, uh, I know it's one day that's coming. That day is coming. And guess what? Today that day came. The rubbish became what? It became something. It became something. Something. Now, you see, for, for me and for you, we like to dwell on what we just see, just a pile of rubbish. But with the eyes of faith, guess what? God is able to bring about good. To some person, that pile of rubbish could have been just firewood. But in the hands of those who know how to make a playset, in the hands of those who know how to turn on bolts and, and make stuff happen, after a couple of hours, it becomes a nice playset. And guess what? I was swinging on those swings today with my children. Praise the Lord. I was saying to my wife, I've never lived in a house that had a place at before. And the Lord has blessed us. And the Lord is blessing our children. The Lord is blessing. By the way, you all have permission to take your kids to the place. It is our place at. Praise the Lord. Our church family, right? See, this is what God can do. God can do, because Paul, he's been through so much, and he has learned the secret of being content, why he knows God is faithful. The one who has started the good work will finish it. The work that God has started in you, he will finish it. The work that he has started in your family, God will finish it. The work God has started in this church family, God will finish it. The work that God has done in this country, God will finish it. God will complete it. Wow. That's living joy. Living, breathing joy. So why do we need to despair and worry and be defeated? Sometimes we just defeat ourselves. You haven't even started the battle, but you get defeated. Maybe God is calling us to get rid of all that defeat all that discouragement, and let that living joy well up in you and begin to move forward in that direction God is inviting us to. It is an upward call. It is pressing in to what God has in store for us. These people, their God is their stomach. Their end is destruction. These are the people that God wants to see saved. These are the people that God's heart breaks for. The ones who live without no purpose. The ones who think just having a lot of money will do or or having health will do or having stuff will do. In reality, they need the hope eternal that only Christ can bring. Only Jesus can save. Their glory is in their shame. I... I ache when I see parades of people who do abominable things against God and show it off as if it's a beautiful thing. Lord, have mercy. We need devout men and women of God to go to those places and begin to pray. And 
they begin to see themselves in light of God's light and love and mercy and be like, oh my goodness, I should not be doing this. And turn from their wicked ways and follow the light of Jesus. And then in verse 20, he says this, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I don't have time to go into all the details here, but I just want you to remember this. This living joy is eternal because our citizenship is not on this earth. You may say, Pastor, I have an American passport or an Israeli passport or, or a Nicaraguan pa or a Brazilian or a... You may say all of those things, but that is not your true citizenship. It is just, you are merely passing through. Our real citizenship is in heaven. That is who you are. You are children of God. I am a child of God. And so I don't get bogged down with the things of the world. Yes, there are joyous moments and sorrowful moments. Yes, I mean, life is all filled with that. And some people live as if they are living just this life only. It is not true. It is not true at all. We must believe and live as citizens of heaven here on earth. We are like agents who have been sent for special assignments. Special assignments for you to reach the lost, for you to disciple people, for you to Continue to do the work with the gifts and graces that God has given you. Your citizenship is not here. You belong to heaven. But many a times we lose sight of heaven. And just we get stuck with earthly things. And no wonder we are thirsty. No wonder we are hungry and starving. Because heavenly people... Feed on the heavenly word. And our stomach is not our God. <laughs> Jesus Christ is God. His word nourishes us. Until our hearts are filled with God, there is always that empty space. Talk to anybody. They'll say, yeah, I've tried this. I've tried that. It just didn't work. Until we find our rest in him. As citizens... We are under the governance of heaven. As citizens, we share in heaven's honors. As citizens, we have property rights in heaven. And I pray that all of us would have mansions in heaven. Amen? Rewards in heaven. What you have done to the least of these. Invest in heaven. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's better investment of all eternity. As citizens, we enjoy the pleasures of heaven. Yes, peace, joy, love, all of the joys of heaven. As citizens of heaven, we love heaven and feel attached there than here. As citizens of heaven, we keep in communication with our native home. And the language of heaven is prayer. Praise is just melodies added to prayer. We continue to communicate. Oh, heaven is in my heart. Nothing can sway me. I have a steadfast joy and a steadfast peace. Nothing, nothing, no news. Yes, there are jarring news all around us. Yes. But if it doesn't bring you to your knees to pray then don't let it affect you. Now we pray. We pray for God's wisdom in those nations. We pray for God's comfort for those who have lost loved ones. Amen. We pray that God's will be done. And we do that with a living joy. Perhaps some of you are on the, on the brink of giving up giving up on yourself or giving up on something or 
a, a career, maybe whatever it is, tonight I believe God is asking us to press on. Be resilient, Christ followers. Be those who do not crumble under pressure, but rather rise up with the living joy that God has given us. And that living joy, his name is Jesus. And he's coming back for me. He's coming back for you. He's coming back for this bride. I am so excited that we can continue to be the unadulterated, pure bride of Jesus, looking to him, loving him, lovesick people who will endure to the very end. Let us pray.